For many, the name of Jack Kerouac conjures up an image of a carefree young man forever travelling the roads of post-war America. Untethered by responsibility, spontaneous, living in the moment. But his life was far more complex, full of bitterness and broken promises, and he spent his final years in poverty, drinking himself into oblivion. Welcome to Insane History. I'm Professor Graham Austin. And today I'm exploring the intriguing life of Jack Kerouac. To get beneath the surface of the man who was adopted as an icon of 60s counterculture and cool. But a shy man, a man who struggled with fame, a man who felt he'd been misunderstood, a very reluctant icon. In 1957, Viking Press, known for its championing of boundary-pushing new writers, published On the Road, a novel by little-known author Jack Kerouac. It was new, it was edgy, it was different. Very different to the more prosaic first novel he had published to favourable reviews, but limited sales seven years previously. Even though it had largely the same cast of characters doing broadly the same things. What was different was the way it was written, and the world it arrived into. Kerouac's book was instantly acclaimed as a major work of fiction, and almost as a sacred text by those starting to feel uneasy with the materialism and hypocrisy of a society that outwardly projected the saccharine sweetness of a Doris Day movie, but was much darker than people were willing to admit. Not everyone liked it, of course, many disapproving of its focus on people and places and pastimes they did not consider worthy of literature, and some, unconvinced by its free-flowing, unstructured, stream-of-consciousness style, dismissed it as typing, not writing. Kerouac was 35 when it appeared, and he found himself famous overnight, fated by those who wanted to make him the prophet of a new age, but hated by those who felt he was undermining the great American dream. It was the kind of fame that anyone would struggle with, the kind of fame that often ends badly. But let's start at the beginning. John Louis Kerouac was born in 1922 in the mill town of Lowell, Massachusetts. His parents were French Canadian and T. Jean, or Little John as he was known, didn't actually speak English until he started school. His father, a fiery, hard drinking man, was a printer and his mother worked in a shoe factory. Both drank heavily and had frequent heated rows and the family were constantly having to move as his father's reckless gambling kept them permanently broke. His mother's favorite was his frail older brother Gerard, who was living on borrowed time because of a rheumatic fever damaged heart. Just before he died at the age of nine, he had visions of the Virgin Mary and forever afterwards was remembered as some kind of saint. Jack was four when he died and grew up being constantly compared, unfavourably, to his lost brother and was always rather shy and reserved. His parents almost missed the fact that Jack was very bright with an extraordinary memory. He was also athletic and won a full ride football scholarship to the elite Horace Mann Preparatory School and then Columbia University in New York City. He played one game but then broke his leg and was out for the season. This gave him more time to read, and he threw himself into the greats of world literature and was inspired by the works of Thomas Wolfe, especially his descriptions of the vast American landscape. Although Kerouac started his second year, he argued with his coach, who kept him on the bench, and in a fit of pique he quit the team, which meant he lost his scholarship and had to leave. He got a job in Hartford, Connecticut, working in a garage during the day and writing at night. Then it was back to Lowell as a sports reporter for the paper he used to appear in for two months. Then down to DC where he worked as a construction worker on the Pentagon building. Still writing in his time off, but also pursuing other pleasures as he went out every night looking for the company of young ladies, although the term he used was somewhat earthier. When America entered the war, he wanted to be part of history, so signed up for the Marines but impatient for his papers to come through, he joined the Merchant Marine instead. And in July 1942, embarked on the SS Dorchester to Greenland. 
a hazardous trip with German U-boats having sunk over a hundred ships that year already. To help out his cash-strapped parents, he boosted his pay for the trip by adding extra kitchen tasks to his other duties. But as so often before and after, he struggled with authority and didn't get on with the bossy cook who barked out orders at him. When he arrived back in the US, he returned to Colombia at the request of his football coach, but walked out again after a month. Still wanting to do something with greater meaning, he joined the United States Naval Reserve, and in February 1943 he underwent 12 days of testing at the US Navy pilot training base in Boston. He passed all the academic tests, but failed the mechanical aptitude test, and because of his cocky attitude he was deemed not temperamentally adapted. So he had to settle for basic training in Newport, Rhode Island. He hated it. He was 21 and had already been to sea and he felt different to the other 18-year-old recruits. He lasted precisely eight days before being admitted to the sick bay with strange behaviour. He was also getting frequent headaches and hearing voices, so he was transferred to the naval hospital. We know a lot about Kerouac's brief naval career, as his entire 150-page military file, including all of his medical records, was made public in 2005. His doctors noted auditory hallucinations, ideas of reference, and feelings that life was not worth living, along with a rambling, grandiose, philosophical manner. He was diagnosed with dementia precox, what we now call schizophrenia, and after six weeks of observation, he was transferred to the Naval Hospital in Bethesda, Maryland, for further evaluation. There, he told his doctors he did not agree with his diagnosis, and explained away his symptoms by saying that prior to enlisting, he had been working 16 hours a day writing a novel in the style of James Joyce. He denied hallucinations, but said he could imagine in his mind whole symphonies and see printed pages of words. His file offers a unique insight into the personality of a young man who had not yet published anything, but who was convinced he was destined for great things. Kerouac seemed to enjoy leading his doctors on, embellishing, exaggerating, even trying to shock them when discussing his life. And they noted that he enjoys rather promiscuous relationships with girlfriends and is boastful of this. In letters to friends, he wrote about how he was quizzed about male relationships as well, and how he laid it on thick, telling them he wasn't in love with any girl and didn't plan to get married. But his records simply note, no apparent conflicts over sexual activity noted. His evaluation included intelligence tests. He later boasted that he got one of the highest ever recorded, but the records show that he had a verbal IQ of 133 and a somewhat lower performance IQ, High, but not off the chart. His father Leo was contacted, who said his son had been boiling for a long time and had always been seclusive, stubborn, headstrong, resentful of authority and advice, being unreliable, unstable and undependable. Maybe they caught him on a bad day, but his mother too described him as stubborn, with a tendency to brood if he was unhappy or lonely. He told his psychiatrists he did not like basic training at all. I just can't stand it. I like to be by myself. And they concluded he was unfit for service, but changed his diagnosis from dementia precox to constitutional psychopathic state schizoid personality, or what we would now call schizoid personality disorder. I must say, I found this a bit puzzling at first. It's a diagnosis that is applied to people who are emotionally detached and avoidant of relationships, and it has a huge overlap with autism. This was even more the case in the early 1940s, as autism had not yet been described, and the definitions from this period are pretty much indistinguishable from what we would now call autistic spectrum disorder. At the end of June, he was officially discharged and went back to New York to hang around with his old friends from Columbia, writing and frequenting the jazz clubs of Harlem. 
he started a relationship with Edie Parker, whose bohemian 118th Street apartment was the chaotic meeting place for progressive arty types and intellectuals, a melting pot of ideas, drugs and casual sex. But restless as ever, Kerouac signed aboard a merchant ship transporting munitions to Liverpool. Always hungry for new experiences, in his two days of shore leave, he managed to get down to London for a Tchaikovsky concert and a woman in a fur coat to keep him warm. Back in New York, he moved into Edie's apartment, where he met fellow restless souls Allen Ginsberg and William Burroughs. And the three of them went on to define and articulate the Beat generation. Yes, it was about literature, but it was more than that. They were forging a new way of being, unselfconscious, unrestrained, doing what they wanted to do, not just what others told them to do, valuing everything and everyone. The group included not just highbrows and bookish types, but people like Herbert Hunker, a Times Square drug addict, petty thief and hustler, who is said to have introduced Kerouac to the word beat. Originally, with no more baggage in its meaning than tired. But from it, Kerouac developed the idea of a class of people beaten down by society. The poor, the drifters, the junkies, the mentally ill, and those whose sexuality challenged the conventional morality of the day. Also in the group was Lucien Carr, a young Columbia student who had a strange relationship with a predatory older man, David Camera who had been following him around for years. In August 1944, something happened in Riverside Park and Camera ended up dead. Carr claimed it was self-defense, but he panicked and dumped the body in the Hudson and then went to Burroughs and Kerouac for help. They eventually persuaded him to turn himself into the police, but were arrested as material witnesses. Burroughs was from a wealthy family and his father bailed him out, but Kerouac's father refused to pay as he had a very low opinion of the people his son was hanging around with. Somehow, he persuaded Edie to marry him, so she could access an inheritance to bail him out. And they were married with a couple of NYPD detectives as witnesses. Very romantic. Once he was off the hook, Kerouac and Edie went to live at her mother's house in Detroit, with Jack going out each morning to work at a trailer factory. But domesticity wasn't his thing, and after two months, he was back in New York. At times, he lived with his parents above a shop in Ozone Park, Queens. But the group gradually reassembled at another chaotic apartment on 115th Street. Jack and Edie, Burroughs, his partner Joan Volmer, the one he later shot, Allen Ginsberg, who had been suspended from Columbia for writing obscenities on his window, and others. It was back to the same life of talking, goofing about, drinking and casual relationships. They also found a way of extracting amphetamine, the active ingredient from benzodrine inhalers, which had been marketed since the 1920s as a nasal and bronchial decongestant, which enabled them to stay up all night philosophizing and putting the world to rights. It's possible that Kerouac had a daughter in 1945 with an old Lowell school friend whose husband was away at war but this was never confirmed one way or the other. Gradually, his dissolute lifestyle began to catch up with him. Although still only 24, he had gone from being a muscular athlete to a paunchy, pale drug user, and he was hospitalized for a thrombosis in his leg. In 1946, his father died of stomach cancer. It was a painful, lingering death, but Jack was with him to the end, and his father's final act was to make him promise to look after his mother. And although Kerouac was not good at sticking to any of his other commitments, looking after his mother was the one thing he cannot be criticised for. Losing his father deeply affected Kerouac, and as therapy, he threw himself into writing a new novel, The Town and the City, a gargantuan 1100-page epic about his adolescence in Lowell and early years in New York. But then, in December 1946, Neil Cassidy breezed into town from Denver with his 16-year-old wife, Lou Ann, and life was never the same again. Neil Cassidy was a poor boy with an alcoholic father who grew up on Skid Row and was always in trouble with the police, but he had a quick mind 
a thirst for knowledge and a full throttle approach to life that was a major influence on Kerouac and the other beat writers. You have to read On the Road to get a sense of Cassidy, or Dean Moriarty as he's called in the book. His energy, his enthusiasm, his devil-may-care attitude made everyone fall in love with him. And when he returned to Denver after a few months, New York just wasn't the same. So Kerouac began the first of his road trips to go and see him. His travels and adventures over the next three years, the people he met and the things he got up to form the basis of On the Road. All he had to do now was find a way of capturing the essence of these trips and getting it down onto paper, without stifling it. He knew he would need to write in a new way, but everything he tried just didn't seem right. Gradually, the vitality of Cassidy's speech and the rhythm of the jazz musicians he loved began to coalesce in his mind. In 1950, his first novel was published after being seriously slimmed down. He got a thousand dollar advance, but it sold only 400 copies, so there were no fat royalty checks. And it was life as usual, writing, and traveling, and drinking. In November, he met Joan Haverty, 19-year-old girlfriend of wild party animal Bill Canastra, who had just been decapitated pretending to climb out of a subway car window in a drunken stunt. Kerouac took her to meet his mother, and two weeks later they were married. He was looking for someone with good housekeeping skills who would look after his mother, and he was impressed with her apartment, and she didn't fancy returning home to her parents, so it was a perfect match. In April 1951, in their Chelsea apartment, in a coffee and benzedrine fueled blaze of activity, he typed out On the Road, on a 120-foot scroll of paper taped together, so he would have no interruptions to his creative flow. Single-spaced, narrow margins, no paragraph breaks. It was done. His masterpiece was finished. The only problem was his publisher rejected it as did many others over the next six years. Meanwhile, his marriage to Joan fell apart after only eight months. He was never faithful to anyone, but when he came home to find her in flagrante with someone, he walked out. When he found out she was pregnant, he suggested she get rid of it, but she refused and their daughter Jan was born. For many years, he denied paternity and refused to pay child support until a blood test when Jan was 10 confirmed he was her father. With no money coming in from his work, Kerouac had to take on endless dead-end jobs to keep himself afloat. But he managed to continue writing and travelling, taking long trips through the US and Mexico, interspersed with episodes of depression, made worse by heavy drinking. He worked on more heavily autobiographical novels, including Dr. Sachs, The Subterraneans, Tristessa and Maggie Cassidy, which chronicle the events of his life, but these two would have to wait several years to be published. In 1953, he became interested in Eastern religion and started reading Hindu and Buddhist texts. And, still penniless, he liberated a copy of the Buddhist Bible from a library to study it further, as he continued travelling, working for short periods on the railroad, reading and pushing on with his writing. His interest in Buddhism was all-consuming for a while, and in an attempt to replicate the experiences of a 9th century Chinese poet, Han Shan, who lived and wrote in the mountains, Kerouac took a job as a fire lookout for the forestry surface on Desolation Peak in Washington State for 63 days in the summer of 1956. He had no contact with anyone, no alcohol, no drugs, and only the Diamond Sutra to read. Hoping for enlightenment, he was instead forced to confront his life stone-cold sober, and he didn't particularly enjoy the experience. Finally, in 1957, after being rejected multiple times, On the Road was published by Viking Press. Revisions had to be made, the most explicit passages were removed or toned down, some scenes deleted, and real names were changed to prevent libel suits. New York Times critic Gilbert Milstein gave the book a rave review, praising it as a major novel and its publication as an historic occasion. 
Although other critics dismissed it as badly written and full of unbelievable characters going nowhere, the buying public loved it. It sold out its first print run in two weeks and two further print runs were needed in its first few months. Kerouac instantly found himself hot property, along with Allen Ginsberg, whose poem How had been published the year before and banned for obscenity, and William Burroughs, whose even more radical work Naked Lunch appeared in 1959. He gave interviews, posed for photos, gave readings, and everyone wanted a piece of him. But he was never comfortable with his fame, or the way his novel was being interpreted, either by those who felt it was a guidebook to free living, or those who considered it a threat to the morality of the nation. The Subterraneans and the Dharma Bums appeared in 1958, and he worked on refining his writing style, combining his spontaneous prose technique with his much more crafted and impressionistic poetry and haiku. He expected the usual moralistic criticism for the Subterraneans, but was disheartened by the negative comments about the Dharma Bums from the leading figures of Buddhism in America, whom he had spent time with and learned from. The more success he had, the more anxious and unhappy he became. By nature he was a loner, and he always considered himself an outsider, but the picture of himself he paints in his novels is different, more self-assured, and he increasingly relied on alcohol to be more like this in public. He looked uncomfortable when he appeared on The Steve Allen Show in 1959, until he starts reading from On the Road. But by the time he appeared on The Firing Line in 1968, hosted by William Buckley, he was a different man, a bitter, surly drunk who was angry at the world. In between was a steady decline into alcoholism which ultimately cost him his life. He knew, and everyone else knew, he was on this path. In 1961, he wrote Big Sur in 10 days while living in the cabin of Lawrence Ferlinghetti, a fellow beat poet, in Bixby Canyon off California's iconic Route 1 coastal highway. It is the first of his works that deals with his life after becoming famous and documents his struggle to cope with this, his increasing alcoholism and its effect on his mind and his inability to accept help to change course. I watched the movie version of Big Sur while making this video. It's beautifully filmed and perfectly captures the sad inevitability of his self-destructive behaviour. But it's, it's not an easy thing to sit through. Two years later, Kerouac's account of his brother's death was published as The Visions of Gérard. And his final book published in his lifetime was Vanity of Deleuze, which deals with his childhood and the wild goings on of the early beat years. Kerouac earned a lot of money from On the Road, although promised film deals never quite came off, so it was not as much as it could have been. He used his earnings to buy a house in Northport, New York, living there with his mother for six years. In 1966, his mother suffered a stroke, and after a couple of years away, he moved back in to live with her in Hyannis, Massachusetts. Shortly afterwards, he married his third wife, Stella Sampras. She was the sister of his old school friend Sebastian, who had been killed in the war at the Battle of Anzio. But it was a marriage of convenience, as he needed someone to look after his mother. Despite the role his work had played in inspiring the counterculture and anti-Vietnam War protest movement of the 1960s, Kerouac was openly critical of it. He was scornful of those who would not fight for their country and publicly argued with Allen Ginsberg and others over the increasing politicisation of the Beat Generation legacy. He felt that the whole Beat thing had been misunderstood and taken in directions it was never meant to go, and he eventually split with Ginsberg, leaving him embittered and isolated. In 1968, Neil Cassidy died in Mexico. It was the end of an era. By 1969, Kerouac was broke, and many of his books were out of print. He was living with Stella and his mother in St. Petersburg, Florida, working on a book about his father's print shop, but mostly spending his days in local bars. He was also working on a book he'd started many years before, about a young black American, his only non-autobiographical novel. And he went into the Cactus Bar in a rough black neighbourhood for research, 
but got badly beaten up. In October 1969, while trying to work, he suddenly felt sick. He rushed to the bathroom where he began to vomit blood. He had cirrhosis of the liver, which often leads to engorged veins in the esophagus, called varices. If they start bleeding, it's often very dramatic and can still be fatal, as the blood's ability to clot is often impaired in liver damage. I saw a few cases in my time as a junior doctor, and it's not a nice way to go. He was taken to St Anthony's Hospital, and despite several transfusions and attempted surgery to stop the bleeding, he died. He was 47. He left $91 in his will. Not much to show for his lifetime's work of 13 novels, a dozen books of poetry, some non-fiction, and quite a few interesting but underrated paintings. But his death sparked new interest in his writing. Previously unpublished work was given the light of day, and his beneficiaries soon found themselves very comfortable. Sadly, this did not include his daughter Jan. He met her only twice, and she received nothing in his will. She lived most of her life in poverty and struggled with drug addiction to the extent of having to fund this through prostitution at times. Like her father, she had a gift for writing, and like her father, she died in her forties. But how can we begin to make sense of his life? I'd better leave it to the literature professors to analyse his work, but I did enjoy listening to Amy Hungerford's lecture on On the Road, and I really like her description of Kerouac as the prophet of wow. Great phrase. But what about Kerouac the man? Whatever you think about his writing, there is no getting away from the fact that he was a very flawed human being. Incredibly selfish, let's face it, all of his novels apart from Pick are about himself. And despite being married three times, I'm not sure he ever had a genuine loving relationship, despite notching up more than 200 liaisons with both men and women. And what about his drinking? People who don't understand addiction might think, why didn't he just stop it if he knew it was killing him? He knew all right, but he couldn't. He had periods of sobriety, not very long ones, but he tried. The problem was he didn't really like the sober Kerouac, the Kerouac who used people, the Kerouac who cared more about his cats than his own daughter. So many writers and artists seem to struggle with addiction that it is easy to conclude that it is an essential part of creativity, but I don't think it is. There are plenty of creatives who have gone about their business without being drawn into the bottomless pit of alcoholism. I do think artists need to experience hardship, conflict, and the darker side of human nature to be truly great. And although this often leads to the seeking of solace in the temporary bliss of substances, reliance on drugs is more an attempt to resolve their inner turmoil than the prerequisite of creative genius. In psychiatric terms, you could make a case for Kerouac having a narcissistic personality disorder. I've also read a suggestion that he had an antisocial personality disorder, but I don't agree with this. He was certainly impulsive, but not aggressive. So what about those Navy psychiatrists? Could they have been right in their assessment? The more I read about the real Kerouac, rather than the fictionalised version of himself, the more I think they got him about right. He wasn't antisocial, but he was somewhat asocial. He didn't need people, other than to perform tasks for him. And this is why he struggled so much with fame. By nature, he really was a loner, happy to go along for the ride, to observe, to record, but not to be the centre of attention. That was Dean Cassidy's job. And that's why I think he was a reluctant icon. Thank you for watching. Uh, I'd love to hear your views on Kerouac. He was a big hero of mine, or at least the uh, sanitised and mythologised version of him was. I think the movies On the Road and Big Sur are worth a watch, 
but they kind of miss somehow the joy and energy of his books. But I would definitely recommend listening to Kerouac's reading of his poetry with jazz piano accompaniment by Steve Allen, which is revelatory. I'll add them to my Amazon store page if you're interested. Please remember to subscribe and click for notifications if you want to be kept up to date with the latest videos. But apart from that, I'll say goodbye and I hope to see you again soon.